Hello everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to be doing our first problem on moment of inertia and the parallel axis theorem. Um, to start off with, I just wanted to say if you didn't see my centroid video, it's going to be really helpful in understanding uh, some of the concepts to deal with these problems. Um, and as always, before we get into a new problem set, I always like to do a brief understanding section. So if you don't need it, you can skip ahead. Uh, but let's read through the problem and then talk about what moment of inertia actually is. So let's determine the moment of inertia of the composite area about the x-axis. So we can see our composite here. We have a triangular shape, rectangular shape, and a circular shape as a whole. All right. And all of these different shapes are going to influence the total or global moment of inertia for this entire shape. But what is moment of inertia? To explain it, we can look at this I-beam that I've drawn up here, where we have our respective axes, z, x, and y. And if we look at the cross section of our I-beam, we can see the I-shape will provide a strong area moment of inertia about the x-axis. Why do I say that? Well, moment of inertia actually refers to the cross section's resistance to bending. And our I-beam happens to be very well versed to resist bending about the x-axis because a key rule to having a strong moment of inertia is that the further a material is spread from your respective axis, the stiffer the cross section will be. So I beams in this case are very useful in construction because you have your flange, which is this section on the top and bottom, very spread out from where that X axis actually is. And it saves on material by not needing to use uh, too much thickness in the web. And in class, we'll also be talking about another term, which is called your polar moment of inertia, which is represented by J. And we can see here that polar moment of inertia uh, will be represented by the resistance to torsion or twisting. So looking back at this top section, we have our X and Y axis, which are parallel to the cross section here. And our Z axis is actually going to be perpendicular to the face of that cross section. So if we applied moment about that axis, we can see that we're actually going to twist the beam, meaning that it's going to create a torsion. So the higher the value of your moment of inertia, the better it is at resisting either torsion or bending. But I keep saying respective axis. What do I mean when I say respective axis? Well, first we can see that moment of inertia can be calculated with respect to X, and it also can be calculated with respect to Y, and it can be calculated with respect to Z. And each of these values are gonna be different based on the respective axis you choose. However, in our case, when looking at X prime, this is a slightly different axis. This is going to be called a local axis. And the local axis simply refers to the axis where the centroid of our simple shape is going to be acting in our cross section. So if we take a look at our composite, we would have multiple local axes for the triangle, for the rectangle, and for the circle. And generally in our coordinate systems, the x and y axis will not lie on these local axes, as we can see here. And that's especially in the case of composite shapes. So this creates a distance d from our local axis to the global predetermined axis. Okay, Therefore, we're left with two separate formulas for determining global uh, moment of inertia and the local moment of inertia. And these formulas actually comprise the parallel axis theorem, which is what we're going to use to calculate the local and global moments of inertia uh, and ultimately solve this composite problem. Okay. So similarly to centroids, as I said uh, up ahead, um, the same rules kind of apply where you have circular holes or holes in general, uh, any negative space inside of a composite shape will subtract from the formula. All right. So as long as we know this, it's pretty simple plug and chug. And once we hop into the problem, we'll get to take a closer look at that. All right, so now we can hop into the problem. Uh, I've updated the drawing slightly just so that we can understand what's going on exactly before we hop into plugging and chugging using this formula here. So I've changed the colors of the diagram a little bit, uh, just indicating with blue the shapes that are going to be positive or addition in our formula and the shapes that are going to be negative, which are going to be the red. So that circle we were talking about earlier, since it's a whole, is going to be subtractive from our total moment of inertia, which makes sense because the less material or the more material taken away from the total composite is going to influence how strong the cross-section is uh, when 
applied with moment, all right, or bending. So what else can we describe here? We can take a look at our local axes that we were talking about. So we have a local axis for each of these individual shapes. So for local axis one, it is referring to the triangular shape, which is a distance D1 away from the global X axis. And it is located at the centroid of that triangle, right? And we are going to calculate how far away that centroid is from the global X axis by finding D1. And then similarly, we have the same concepts for the second shape, which is the rectangle, and the third shape, which is the circle. All right. Lastly, we could talk about these formulas down here, which are the calculations for the moment of inertia for specific geometric shapes. So shape one, shape two, and shape three are all simple geometric shapes. And these formulas are geometric properties of the area elements of these shapes. So the triangle has the moment of inertia calculation of one over 36 base times height cubed. And then similarly, we have calculations for the rectangle, which is shape two, which is one over 12 base times height cubed. And then the circle is one over four pi r to the power of four. Now, what you can do if you don't have a uh, reference material, you can simply search uh, on Google for the area moment table, and it will come up uh, and show you these geometric properties for each shape. So now we can get into solving, and it's pretty much just plug and chuck from here. Uh, the first thing we need to do is just consider uh, our first shape and work onwards from there. So following the parallax axis theorem formula, we're going to take our local moment of inertia calculation, which is going to be first 1 over 36 base times height cubed. And we're considering this triangular shape first. So we're taking 300 millimeters times 200 millimeters to the power of 3. Then we're going to be following that by adding the area of this triangle, which is going to be one half base times height, 300 times 200. And then also considering the distance dy from the global axis to the local axis of this shape. Why is it called dy and not dx? This is because we are going a distance up the y axis with respect to the x axis globally. Okay, so that distance d is going to be uh, using a similar rule that we considered in distributed loads, finding that centroid for a triangular distribution. And that height, or that d, is going to be one third of the total height here. Okay, So we actually have one third of 200 millimeters. And then that is all squared. And that's it for shape one. Now moving on to shape two, we have a plus sign because shape two is the rectangular blue shape, which is still retained in our composite. And we're following a similar rule. We take the local moment of inertia, which is gonna be one over 12, taking the base, which is 300 times the height of 200. And that is all cubed plus the area of the rectangle, which is 300 times 200. And then doing a very similar thing to find dy, and it's going to be half of this total height, and it's simply going to be 100 mil squared. All right, then moving on to the final shape, we remember that this is a whole, so we have to consider a subtraction for it. But besides that, everything else remains pretty similar. We're finding that local moment of inertia for this circle, which is going to be 1 over 4 pi r, which is our radius of 75 mil, to the power of 4. And then we move on to the addition section, which is going to be adding the area, which is pi times 75 squared. And then we are also going to be multiplying by that same distance of 100 mil, because d2 and d3 are exactly the same, because the center of the circle lands exactly on the center of the rectangle. And that simplifies the problem a little bit. Uh, I hope the rest of it wasn't too tricky, though. <laughs> um, so for the final answer, this will leave us with a total moment of inertia for this composite, composite shape of around 798 times 10 to the power of 6 millimeters to the fourth. And you guys can feel free to work through this problem again and make sure that 
uh, all of your units work out to come out to a millimeter to the fourth power uh, unit. And that's pretty much the end of the problem. I hope this helped. Uh, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into moment of inertia uh, in a later problem. But just for now, this is just to cover the basic concepts. So hope this helped, and uh, thanks for watching.